Yes, thank you. So as it was told, we are going to give a beginner-friendly introduction to NLP using scikit-LM. If you want to follow the slides, you can scan this QR code and open it on your devices. Yeah, and before we begin, I would like to ask a question. Have you ever tried using large language models for NLP tasks? Maybe just raise your hands if you did. Okay, one, two, three, four, maybe 10 people at most, so not that many, which means that you're in the right place. Uh, because today we are going to show that this can actually be as easy as writing three lines of scikit-learn compatible code. Yeah, and let us briefly introduce us again. I am Oleg, I am working as a data scientist at SCCH, which is uh, an applied research center in Upper Austria. Yes, and I'm Irina. I also work as a data scientist in Austria. Um, in our spare time, both Oleg and I contribute to several open source projects, one of which is Psychit-LM, which will be the focus of today's talk. Yes, so uh, since this talk is aimed at absolute beginners, we will start with introducing some common NLP tasks. Then we will explain how those can be solved with large language models. Afterwards, um, we will introduce scikit LLM and explain how it simplifies the whole process. And finally, we will briefly touch the topic of using different LLM backends for both inference and fine tuning. So, what are the common NLP tasks we might need to solve? Uh, the most classic one is obviously the text classification, where the idea is to assign a label from a predefined set to an input sample. For example, here we have a sentence saying uh, a great service for an affordable price, and we can determine that the, its sentiment is positive. Another common NLP task probably most of you have to deal with from time to time is the text translation. For example, here we need to translate a sentence in English into German. Moving on, the text summarization task involves condensing a large chunk of text into a more compact representation while retaining all of the key ideas. And the final example I'm going to give for now is the named entity recognition task, where the goal is to find and classify all of the key concepts in the text. For example, here we have the sentence, Europython will take place in Prague, uh, and we can determine that the Europython is an event and Prague is the location. And obviously there are many more tasks and this list is far from being exhaustive and we could probably spend the duration of the entire presentation just enumerating all of those tasks, but probably it's going to be a bit boring. So uh, let's talk about something else and namely how large language models um, can be used here. Yeah, and the first question we should ask ourselves is whether we can use LLMs for NLP tasks. Um, it's difficult to give a definitive answer for every single task since there are just too many of them. However, at least for the ones we uh, introduced earlier, the answer is yes. Yeah, and indeed, if we just construct a simple prompt and pass it to ChatGPT, um, it already returns the results more in line with what we would expect. So now that it's clear that in principle, LLMs can be used for the NLP tasks, um, the next question is whether we should use them. And again, it depends, and probably you would have to decide for yourself. And if you do decide to use LLMs, there are certainly going to be many disadvantages in such an approach, but there are also going to be many advantages. Just to name a single one, um, if you use LLMs, you could use the same model for many downstream tasks, uh, which would simplify its management and potentially save the costs. However, building the whole NLP pipeline from scratch might be inconvenient since you would have to manually construct the prompts, do LLM calls, validate the output, etc. There are some libraries that provide certain levels of abstractions. However, those are usually a bit too general and not necessarily beginner friendly. 
At the same time, there is an interface probably every single data scientist is familiar with, which is the scikit-learn interface. Uh, so it would be really nice if we had something similar, but for NLP, um, for example, there could be a GPT classifier that uses ChatGPT under the hood to classify the text, but otherwise it, it's fully compliant with the scikit-learn API. And this is exactly the functionality scikit-LM provides. Scikit-LM is an open source Python library that allows to seamlessly integrate large language models into scikit-learn for different NLP tasks. Yeah, and believe it or not, this sentence wasn't even GPT generated. Um, yeah, and now I would like to give a word to Irina, who is going to give a more practical introduction to Scikit-LM starting with the text classification task. Yeah, so let's consider the classification example we've seen earlier, where the task is to generate a sentiment of a given text. Um, the prompt for that task includes the instruction highlighted in blue, the sample to classify highlighted in green, and the list of candidate labels which are in yellow. This is a typical example of a zero-shot classification, or more precisely, the classification using zero-shot prompting. The concept behind this method is that we don't give the model any hints on how to classify the text. Instead, we expect it to use its background knowledge to determine the most appropriate label. Now let's have a look at how it works in Scikit-LLM. Firstly, we need to import the zero-shot classifier and then use a very familiar Scikit-Learn API in order to obtain the predictions in just three lines of code. The zero-shot approach is suitable when you either have um, no label data available or you need a very cheap solution since the zero-shot prompts are usually very short and therefore they don't consume many tokens. However, the trade-off is that this approach usually offers lower accuracy compared to other approaches we will see in the next slides. Now, suppose you have some label data available or you are willing to manually create a few label demonstrations. In that case, you could use another technique known as a few-shot prompting. The main idea here is that you include a few labeled examples or shots alongside the prompt. For instance, in this example, one demonstration per label, per sentiment, is provided in the prompt. If we have a look at Scikit-LM code, we can see that it remains mostly unchanged, and the transition from the zero-shot to the few-shot approach only requires some minor adaptations in the import statement. The few-shot approach can outperform the zero-shot approach when provided with as little as one demonstration per class. However, it's not that uncommon to have data sets containing hundreds or even thousands of labeled examples. And even though common LLMs um, have very high context windows lens that are capable of fitting that many observations, still processing such a large number of examples would be costly and the efficiency of this approach is also questionable. Therefore, we can extend the idea of the few-shot prompting by incorporating the additional pre-processing step that would dynamically select only n most relevant examples. We call this approach a dynamic few-shot. The idea is as follows. During the training step, the label data is embedded and the vector store is created. And during the inference step, the user's query is embedded and only n nearest neighbors for each class are retrieved from the vector store. These samples are then included as demonstrations into a prompt. That approach allows us to basically indefinitely scale the training set size while maintaining relatively constant token usage. The prompt for the dynamic view shot would be identical to the one we used for um, the few shot prompting. However, the main difference here is that the demonstrations added into the prompt are dynamically selected by the classifier. So, dynamic view shot classifiers efficiently utilize large amounts of training data, but it obviously comes with additional token consumption and therefore costs. 
So overall, the message should be as follows. If you have lots of training data and high accuracy is your primary goal, then start immediately with a dynamic few shot approach. Otherwise, consider starting with a zero shot approach as a baseline and then switch to a few shot approach if necessary. Another classification approach I would like to cover is called a chain of thought classification. The main idea here is that the model is prompted to provide intermediate reasoning step before it generates the final label. As you can see here, we modified the prompt used for the zero shot classification by additionally asking the model to explain its answer. As a result, the model first explains its reasoning and then provides a label. The chain of thought approach potentially enhances reasoning capabilities and also offers better explainability since it does not only provide the label but also the model's reasoning as an output. However, this approach comes with additional tokens, consumption and costs. To give you some idea on the performance of different approaches, we have evaluated the classifiers on binary and multi-class classification datasets. For all of our experiments, we use GPT-3.5 and GPT-4.0 models from OpenAI. Um, we used a Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank dataset for that. Um, this dataset contains a corpus of phrases from movie reviews. On this slide, we can see the results obtained in a binary setting. The table show that the few-shot approach improved the accuracy of both models. However, the chain of thought approach did not improve the performance of GPT-4.0 model and even a bit worsened the accuracy of the GPT-3.5 model. For assessing the multi-class classification, the SST fine-grained dataset has been used where the list of possible labels is extended to five. We can see that the few-shot approach improved the accuracy of both models and the chain of thought approach did improve the accuracy of both models even to a greater extent. Based on these results, we can assume that making use of the model's reasoning is advantageous for more complex tasks, while it does not improve or even confuses the model on simpler tasks. Until now, we have only discussed single-label classification tasks. However, LLMs can also perform multi-label classification. For instance, in this example, a review may be categorized into several classes at the same time, for example, price, delivery speed, and service quality. Psychit LLM natively supports multi-label classification through a special multi-label estimator. This estimator takes the maximal number of labels as a hyperparameter and otherwise works identically to the single-label classifiers we've seen earlier. Additionally, I would like to make a small remark about the zero-shot classifiers. It was mentioned before that those do not require any label data, but you might have noticed that all the code snippets you've seen so far um, had still both X and Y been passed to the fit method. Therefore, you might have a very logical question, how can I use the classifier when no training data is available? And the answer is very simple, you just need to pass none instead of X and a list of candidate labels as Y. So far we have discussed the text classification tasks, um, where the input is a text and the output is a label or a set of labels. However, as mentioned in the introduction, text classification is just one of many NLP tasks. Another category of tasks includes text-to-text -text modeling, where both input and output are unstructured text segments. For instance, here the LLM performs two consecutive text-to-text -text transformations. Firstly, it summarizes the provided text in 10 words, and then it translates the, the summarized text into the Czech language. These tasks can also be performed by scikit-LLM using specific 
uh, scikit learn transformers like a summarizer and a translator. As you can see here, firstly, we need to initialize a summarizer to transform the initial text X and then transform the result further using a GPT translator. However, there is a minor issue with this example. As you may have observed, we manually pass the output of the first um, task into the second one. It would be similar to asking ChatGPT to summarize a text and then manually copying and pasting the output into a subsequent prompt for translation. A more natural approach would be to continue the conversation and ask the model to translate already summarized text without manually copying and pasting. When working with Psych.LM, we can skip the step of manually chaining the components by using the fact that each estimator in Psych.LM is Psych.Learn compatible estimator and therefore can be used in the pipeline object. Here you can see that we have formed a pipeline that consists of two, um, of two uh, steps. Firstly, we apply a GPT summarizer and then we apply a GPT translator. So that was it about the text test tasks. And now Oleg is going to introduce another task supported by Psychitalm, which is a text tagging. <clears throat> yeah, so the main idea about the text tagging is to take an arbitrary original text and augment it with some um, XML-like text. So as you might imagine, there are quite a few tasks that can be formulated this way. However, currently Psychitalium only supports one of them, which we already know about, the named entity recognition. So using the named entity recognition task in Psychitalium is uh, also very easy. You just need to instantiate the NER object and pass a dictionary of entities into it where the keys are the potential entity names and the values are the textual descriptions. Yeah, so after the scikit-lm produces the text output, um, it's also, it can also be automatically parsed and transformed into a highlighted human readable form, similar to the one you are seeing on the slide. This works both in the Jupyter notebooks uh, by displaying this text in line, but it also works in the standalone scripts by generating a separate HTML page. Now I would like to switch the topic a little bit and talk about different API families. Um, as you probably noticed so far, we always used GPT, chat GPT for all of the examples. However, it's not the only model that is supported by Scikit LLM. Um, in Scikit LLM, all estimators are split into multiple API families, where the family is mostly defined by the schema of the underlying API. Um, so there are family-specific variants of different estimators. For example, here we have the GPT classifier for the GPT family and vertex classifier for the vertex family. And on top of that, each API family can work with different backends. So the GPT backend can work with the OpenAI, Azure, local GGUF models via GPT for all, and a virtually any backend by providing a custom URL and if necessary, using um, an OpenAI compatible proxy server. Uh, but the usage of this proxy server is not always required since there are already many different providers that um, support the standard OpenAI API. For example, the famous hugging face inference endpoints. Yeah, and the Vertex family supports Palm 2 and Gemini models in the Vertex AI. Switching between those different families is relatively easy as the full import path and the um, class name consists of two things. The 
class the task descriptor and the family name itself. So for example, here we have a zero shot GPT classifier where the zero shot classifier is the task descriptor, meaning it should be used for the zero shot classification. And the GPT is obviously the family. And if we want to switch it to the vertex family, we adjust the import statement a little bit, but everything else stays mostly the same. Yeah, and since there is not much time left, I would just quickly touch upon the topic of the fine-tuning of closed-source LLMs. As you probably know, both uh, OpenAI and Vertex provide the REST APIs for the fine-tuning of their closed-source LLMs, which means that you can actually fine-tune uh, ChatGPT on your own data. Uh, however, I must warn you that the fine-tuning costs can get out of hand really, really quickly. Uh, so <laughs> that's not something you should uh, be using as your first approach. And we would always recommend to start with something really simple. For example, the zero-shot classification as the baseline and slowly increase the complexity if it's needed. But if the fine-tuning is really needed for your use case or you're just eager to try it and you're not afraid of the costs, um, yeah, this functionality is implemented in the Scikit LM and it uses the same three lines of Scikit learned code so you don't really have to learn anything new in order to do that. Yeah, so that was it for now. Um, Wait a second, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, you can check out the Scikit LLM uh, GitHub page, and we would really appreciate if you could start it. I guess right now we are about 15 starts away from reaching 3K. Uh, and also, if you want to check our other projects or simply get in contact with us, please go to our website where you will find all the necessary links. And the final announcement, we also have a small table right behind this room where we have lots of stickers. So if you want to grab a sticker or just have a chat, please find us there. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you much for your talk. It was really good and we all learned a lot. So now we have some time for questions. If anybody has questions, you can go to this microphone here in the middle of the room and ask your questions. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to ask a question. Um, so when we pass examples, how do we actually pass examples? Because I didn't, I didn't see that in the code, and I was wondering if that's something that um, it's handled by the library or if you handcraft your examples and then Pass them. What exactly do you mean by the examples? So in few shot classification, you mentioned that we can pass some examples. Ah, yeah, so this is the training set basically. When you do classifier to fit with the X and Y, uh, the X are the actual texts. I, I don't see the pointer, so these are the X's. And the negative, positive, and neutral is the list of your Y's. Okay, so your examples are, the examples are treated as a typical um, training set yes, in psychic yes. terms. Okay, that's very cool. Um, okay, then I'll carry on with another question. Um, so uh, you, you talked about dynamic uh, example selection. Yes. And how that works really well. Uh, yeah, it works really well. <laughs> did you try to combine it with other methods for prompting, like with uh, COT? No, not yet, but probably it would work even better. <laughs> okay, so can you please explain how would that look like, like to combine both chain of thought prompting and... I mean, right now it's not natively supported, so yeah, you could do that, but probably you would have to tinker a bit with the library. Probably this is something we should add in the future. Uh, yeah, but basically the, the standard chain of thought is just a zero shot thing with some additional explanation, but you could have a few shot with also some explanation shoots, which would be the equivalent of what you're asking about. Okay, so then you would have an example which includes the chain of thought. I mean, you, for that you might need the examples that already have the explanations in the training set, but also it's possible to bootstrap the explanation. So first you use LLM to provide the explanations and then you use it for the subsequent, um, for the subsequent uh, 
few short chain of thought, and there are actually some studies that suggest that you do not necessarily need the handcrafted explanations, and if you just have it in the prompt, it already uh, improves the performance. There are also some studies that suggest that for the few short case, even if your training data is total nonsense, you could just have the random labels, it already improves the performance. Okay, super interesting. And you mentioned that it's an open source project, right? Yes, at the very last slide there is a GitHub link. So if you want to check it out, we are also looking for the contributors. So yeah, that's what I was wondering, <laughs> if you're accepting contributors, it could yes, be sure. a very interesting opportunity for some people. Yeah. So please. Yeah. One, one question, thank you for your presentation. And which type of tokenization do you use? Uh, in uh, GPT models? I mean, we are not explicitly using the uh, tokenization schema because every single model has its own tokenizers and usually, for example, when you do the API call to the, um, to the OpenAI API, it does the tokenization on the server side, so it's kind of abstracted away. And the same thing if you are using the local uh, GGUF models, it already knows which tokenizer to use automatically, so you don't really have to worry about the tokenization at all. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, about the providers that you show, under your experience, some are better for different tasks. For example, uh, GPT is better for touch generation and Gemini better for Laveler? Uh, I would say um, GPT-4 is almost always better for every task, which is unfortunate, but for now it's, it's true. Nice, so thank you guys for presenting and thank you all for your questions and for being here. Uh, next, we actually have lunch. Thank so. you. <laughs>